All righty. I assume it, uh, can you see my screen? <laughs> Do yes, the standard, <laughs> awesome. <Yep. laughs> it's like the bingo, start your bingo card for, uh, can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yeah. Uh, anything. Uh, anyway, well, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, I'm super excited to, uh, this is my first time giving this particular topic of talk because uh, this project is currently ongoing. <laughs> oh, so <you> feel special. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, but yeah, so today I want to talk about a couple different things. Um, first and probably most uh, foremostly is quantum memories and uh, taking uh, a look at those. How do we actually learn about um, kind of uh, what association quantum uh, is also about of building the community of, in this case, we're interested in quantum software developers specifically. So um, in my slides here uh, are all interactive running in my in a browser. So you can actually just, um, I posted links in most of the chats. So if anybody wants to follow along or run things in their own browser, you absolutely can. <laughs> um, and I should also note that this work has been supported by the Unitary Fund, which is uh, another nonprofit that supports uh, micro, or uh, gives out micro grants for open source quantum projects. So a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I'm basically an independent quantum technologist. <laughs> so I, I am a Microsoft MVP. That does not mean I work for Microsoft. <laughs> um, so I do a lot of live streaming on Twitch. I write books. Uh, you can see a couple of them here. Uh, the one we just finished uh, was Learn Quantum Computing with Python and Q Sharp. Um, <laughs> my dog here helps me a lot when I'm, I'm live streaming on, on YouTube and, and Twitch, uh, which is really fun. I also write books for babies. But mainly, my passion is trying to figure out how to build and develop tools for the quantum community to actually make more cool stuff. Um, so what I want to share with you today is uh, basically three things. Uh, one, what is memory for a quantum computer and why do we need it? Um, two, the actual project <laughs> that motivated this, uh, which is a Q Sharp library that we've been developing in the open um, where we implement a bunch of quantum memory proposals. And then also uh, kind of some reflections and, and learnings that I've had in the process of working on this project and developing this project about how we can adapt some of the best practices from open source communities to our community here in, in quantum computing. So uh, to start out, <laughs> quantum memories. Uh, so this presentation is running on RAM. <laughs> Uh, the stuff in my computer is, is equally rainbowy here, <laughs> but uh, classical RAM is, uh, so that'd be random access memory, is really cheap, really fast. You know, I, you, you can buy an awful lot of it for a fairly small amount of money these days. Um, it's implemented in hardware with transistors and generally kind of laid out as um, grids or cells that you can uh, read from or write to pretty standard. You've, if you've probably done any sort of low level programming, you've, you've had to kind of think maybe a little bit about this uh, sort of uh, layout. So quantum applications too might also need some memory. Um, it is true that you could um, encode your entire problem in basically one circuit, run it and get the solution and not actually have to store or um, kind of look up any other values um, to your program. But especially uh, when it comes to machine learning algorithms, we're finding there's places where it's like we really actually would like to be able to store some information. Um, like it makes sense for quantum machine learning things because in classical machine learning, what you're doing is you have this you know, network or structure and you have weights and you have to basically update, you're trying to tweak and update those weights. So you have to kind of store those weights from, from iteration to iteration. And so, um, a lot of these proposals will just say, uh, and we assume we have quantum memory, <laughs> which is very different from saying that we have it. Um, it. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to separate uh, separate concerns here, but some so some quantum algorithms um, could really benefit if if we actually had these. <laughs> um, so, uh, can can we actually do this? <laughs> you. It, it might seem like, well, why can't we? But uh, 
yes, we can, <laughs> uh, but it's not actually that easy. Um, the challenge really is if we have, say we have this algorithm where we found we have a certain speed up for this, this classical task that we want, but we haven't taken, haven't taken into account the cost of the memory yet. <laughs> um, quite frequently when you take that application and then you add in the cost, you know, best known costs that we have for memories, you lose your speed up. <laughs> So, you know, you have this, this app, really interesting application that goes from being interesting to not so interesting, and you might as well go back to doing it on your classical computer, if, and, and if you can. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is the problem. It's not clear, actually, if we'll be able to do this efficiently at all let alone in a fault-tolerant fault setting. So even, even if we leave uh, error correction and, and fault tolerance alone, this can still be incredibly challenging to do just based on the number of times we'd have to query the QRAM or, or the memories, um, which kind of maybe leads you to, to something we'll see later of we really need to optimize the costs of queries to these, um, to these memories. But often these, uh, you know, why, why is it not efficient to do it? Physical limitations like coherence times, <laughs> uh, error rates, um, and hard, like even what gates are supported on hardware. I realize I have a typo there. <laughs> Oops, I'll fix that. Um, but yeah, like most qubits don't, coherence time is basically how long can you be using that qubit before you kind of like lose its information and it starts um, in like, interfering with the environment around it. Um, that can be extremely short, <laughs> um, like microseconds, milliseconds, it really, so it depends on what you're trying to calculate. Um, and what's interesting is there's been a lot of different approaches for how we actually could go about implementing these. Um, and each one kind of has <laughs> that each each one has pros and cons, right? So you know, do you care about having the fewest number of qubits, and you don't really care like how many gates you have to do to do that, or do you care you have more qubits available, or you really, you know, it's extremely costly to do t gates or something like that, and you want to minimize that. So those are the kind of trade offs that we need to look at to try to figure out if we can, <laughs> if we can design memories that actually won't blow away any advantages we get from the algorithms we want to use them in. So thinking very practically about what actually would describe a quantum memory, we're again going to kind of have this mental model of like data cells that have an address and have data in them. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, I am going to have to reload. I'm doing this in the one second. Can I re, re start the thing here? Okay, cool. One second. <laughs> relaunch it. Uh, the issue here, so I'm, <laughs> what I'm doing here sneakily is I'm running this actually in with a service called my binder, which uh, takes the code and the presentation that's in my open source repo and runs it on a remote service. Because I hadn't run any cells for over 10 minutes, they were trying to do garbage collection and close, <laughs> close the session. Um, but it's all right, we're back. Not debug. Okay. My apologies. Okay, so here we are. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll use the same mental model of having these memory cells that have an address and then they have data in that particular cell. Um, just checking for questions. Uh, then uh, if we actually want to get something out of this memory, uh, we're going to query it. <laughs> same, same kind of concepts that we have with classical RAM. Um, and there's interestingly a couple different ways we can actually do that querying. We can uh, give, uh, so here, if our data is a bit string B of A, so this is a classical bit string, not quantum information or not quantum data. We totally can store quantum data with uh, the QRAMs, but for the most part, the applications we were looking at and the implementations we were looking at 
specialize in storing classical information. So for now, just assume these memories are storing classical data, which you know could be the weights for your, your network that you're trying to train. Um, so uh, if you have an address A and you query, you can uh, potentially get the data read out as either a phase. So basically you can you can turn that into a phase information that might be more useful for the algorithm that you're going to then take this and use it in. Or uh, you can read it out as like a bit value as a number state or something like that. So um, I think the bit value ones are a little bit easier to understand <laughs> uh, because it's if you go to measure it, you actually just get directly out the bit string. But uh, this phase readout is actually pretty important and common, uh, say, in like Grover's algorithm. So this is actually pretty similar. We can actually use our QRAMs to replace some of the, like to implement part of Grover's algorithm, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, please, if you have questions about anything here, please feel free to put them in chats. I am I'm trying to watch. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, anyway, so we have a couple different approaches that we can take here, um, which we'll, we'll call QROMs and QRAMs. <laughs> QROMs, uh, again, like the classical analog of read-only memories, uh, are basically like lookup tables. Um, the nice part about these uh, memories is you don't actually have to set aside qubits to, um, to run them or use them. You basically, what you do is you take um, your table of addresses and, and, and bit values, and you basically design a circuit that when you um, apply it to multiple registers, uh, where one is your address and one is your like target, um, then you can, uh, you don't like, you can just, that's just an operation and there's, it's a fixed cost. So you want to try and make that operation as small as possible. Um, but it's just that you don't have to basically, it costs you no qubits to do, <laughs> um, unless you need auxiliary qubits to do it. But uh, for the most part, we don't, <laughs> the ones we have are, are just straight up operations. The other option is kind of a more traditional or like more analogous to classical memory of a, a QRAM or quantum RAM. And this type of memory you can actually read and write to. So here we actually are setting aside groups of qubits and saying, hey, you know, these qubits, this is our memory, please don't touch. <laughs> um, and we can do queries and write operations to those registers or to that memory register. Um, but we do have to then basically make sure that our, the rest of our calculations complete before uh, the coherence time of those qubits. <laughs> um, for the most part here in our library implementation, we're, nothing is hardware specific, so we don't, we're not doing any, any of these timing or investigating those sorts of uh, questions. Um, I see there's a question about for the readout from phase, what does minus one to the B sub A mean? So that's basically uh, kind of like a parody. Um, so yeah, you're, you're taking the, the in this case, the bit value was a single value. So it's basically you're toggling the phase based on the bit value. You can do this in a more continuous fashion as well. Um, but basically the idea is that you change the phase out front um, because the, the amplitudes uh, are complex numbers. So you can actually um, basically just toggle the, the phase dial in between uh, your different states to actually encode what data was stored at that address. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> we'll, we'll look at some actual code here in a, in a minute and maybe that'll help. Um, so yeah, to go into a little bit more depth, um, uh, QROMs, I, I like to think of them as basically just lookup tables <laughs> or truth tables, things like that. Um, you have to know the data ahead of time. That's a big constraint. Um, you might be able to do some pretty good optimization ahead of time as well. So that's kind of um, one of our future directions that we're really looking at is how can we actually do some of that, that work ahead of time so that our implemented circuit is as small uh, as possible. 
Um, so here would be a circuit diagram of a, a fairly simple QRAM, or sorry, QRAM, which would, uh, it's a three bit address. So you can see here, there's a one, a two, a three. Um, and you, that's basically a binary valued address uh, register. And if we look here at kind of the, a like bracket notation of what's happening here is we start with an address register A and a target um, qubit in the state zero. And then after our QROM, basically what we have is our address remains unchanged. And then we have in the, the target qubit, we basically put the data that was at that address A. And so there's a pretty straightforward way to do this, uh, basically with multi-controlled C knots. <laughs> um, and the example here has just, our, our data bit here is just one bit, but this does generalize for, for multi, like multi-bit data values. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can see here, uh, open circles mean control on the value zero and closed circles mean control on the value one. So basically, if we put in our address here and it's either 000, 001, 011, or 111, we will flip this bit. Um, and this does mean we can query in superposition and we can query, you know, however we prepare that address register, we can, we can do. Um, so looking now at the one, <laughs> uh, I, I really like QROMs because it seems really neat. Like you can just kind of pre-compute all of this and get this really nice operation. Um, QRAMs are a little bit messier because you actually have to keep around these qubits. <laughs> but uh, you know, it is where you can actually write write to the memory. So um, definitely has its its benefits. Um, but it, and it also means you don't have to know what the data that goes in the memory before you actually start. Um, your application because you can write to it while you're going. Um, an example, <laughs> a rather large uh, example of a bucket brigade. Um, so bucket brigade is one possible proposal for a QRAM. There are many, many different proposals and many different like variations. Um, uh, but one like kind of the most basic or most straightforward one that we, we chose to implement first um, and I think is just kind of a good example of, of the general concept <laughs> is called Bucket Brigade. Um, but here now, instead of just having two registers where we have the address and where we're gonna put effectively the answer, <laughs> now we have our address register. Um, tau here is basically like a scratch. These are all scratch qubits um, or auxiliary qubits. Then we have M, which is our actual memory register. So these m qubits have to hang around all the time, <laughs> or as long as we want to be able to query this memory or write to this memory. And then the last uh, register we have here is, is where we're actually reading out the answer. So I'm not, <laughs> the point here is not to like make you try to squint at this uh, spaghetti of a circuit <laughs> and try to understand what's going on. Uh, what I want to emphasize is there's basically two parts uh, to this, um, to a bucket brigade sort of implementation. There's uh, what's called the fan out, which is where you take um, your address represent where it's um, a binary representation of your address and you turn it into um, what's sometimes called a one hot encoding or basically you have here as many scratch qubits as you have possible binary addresses. <laughs> um, so you might start to see here why the number of qubits kind of starts to explode with these. Um, so if you have three address qubits, then you need two to, th two to the three. Um, so you need eight scratch qubits here. Um, but then what that allows you to do is uh, in the readout phase, you can control on basically um, for every address that you query here, you'll basically get one of these qubits here uh, toggled to one. And then you will be able to then control and then flip the output uh, based on both was that address one and was is there a one at that uh, memory location. <laughs> um, but so most of the different proposals for QRAM are kind of like a variety of optimizations, a variety of optimizations of either 
the fan out part of this or the readout part of this, which you can parallelize and, and multiplex in a variety of different ways. Um, so here's kind of an animation or another way to look at what's happening with the bucket brigade uh, queries. So um, kind of the, the fan out part is really, you could think of as like a binary tree. <laughs> So you have these different qubits uh, at each of these nodes that basically say go left or right <laughs> um, when you query. And so you basically dial it up by setting each of these nodes to you know, which way um, the actual kind of where you want the query to go. And the buckets down here at the bottom represent, basic, represent the qubits that are actually storing the information. So you can see like the red uh, qubits come in here and set set these nodes to basically dial up the address. And then you have the actual bus qubit that comes and picks up the value at that particular location. Um, <laughs> I, Olivia made, so if you want to learn more like specifically in depth about all of these different proposals and the trade-offs, um, it's not, I, I'm a quantum experimentalist. <laughs> I generally am more interested in how I actually build these. Um, but one of my coworkers on, and teammates on this project is Olivia DiMatteo, who actually is a, a specialized researcher in QRAMs. So um, she recently has given a talk uh, where you can, if you want to learn more about like specific algorithmic complexities of these different implementations and things like that, I will put this uh, link in the chats. There we go. Um, yeah, so um, QRAMs are not the entirety of my focus here for the talk. So I, what I really want to um, figure out is like, wh where do we go? You know, we have all of these different proposals. They all have different trade-offs. You know, I have an application that needs a QRAM. What, what do I do now? <laughs> um, what we really need to be able to do is take all of these uh, proposals and like many other things in quantum computing right now, benchmark them. <laughs> and actually understand, you know, what are the costs, uh, you know, where, where, where does it make sense to actually use these? Um, so, and, and, and likely, you know, the best solution for any particular application or problem is going to be some combination of, of different things we have here. So, uh, you know, so <laughs> the, uh, this project came out of basically discussions and actually uh, one tweet by Chris Ferry, I will blame him on this. <laughs> um, but, you know, we were just kind of discussing on, on Twitter and, and some different and Q Sharp community forums and stuff and saying, hey, is this something we can actually figure out? Like, you know, it was, it's been a pretty hot topic in discussion. I know on, on Twitter, like, you know, some people are very like, we definitely can make them and use them. And some people are like, they'll never be useful. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a tool builder. I like to try and figure out how to answer questions. And so um, I thought, well, maybe like, let's actually just implement them and, and figure this out. <laughs> um, so Q Sharp really was, there are lots of different quantum development platforms. I'm sure many people here work for many of the different companies that are making these different platforms. Um, but based on our discussions, uh, Q Sharp really addressed our needs for this project. Um, it's an extensible, portable, and open source framework. I am really excited that pretty much all of our quantum computing platforms at this point are open source, which I think is really awesome. Um, but things uh, like Q Sharp being a high level language, it is an actual new language. It is not C Sharp. It is not. <laughs> it's, it is a specially designed domain specific language for quantum computing um, and is hardware agnostic. Like it's a new thing. It, this is a very common misconception that I think when I you know, talk with people a lot, they think Q, because there is a sharp, it means that this is C sharp, but it is not. <laughs> um, I'm mainly a Python developer. And so, um, and I, I can use uh, Q sharp with Python. So uh, to the next point, it works where, my team works. Um, we work on all different operating systems. We use different tools and platforms. Some of us use VS Code or Sublime Text. Some of us use like Visual Studio and it works everywhere or everywhere, <laughs> most of the places we are working. Um, uh, it has one of the really killer things though is it had a built-in resource estimator tool that really made kind of 
and, and I'll be able to show you here uh, right in my browser uh, why that's why it was so useful. Um, and uh, especially to me, having a good supportive community to actually build this project where, you know, if there's things that we didn't understand or didn't know how to do, we knew that there were people there who would actually be invested in helping us <laughs> figure this out. Um, so yeah, let's actually take a look at the library. Um, I am going to just uh, take a break real quick to reconnect this. Um, but if anybody has any questions real quick about QRAM more generally, please uh, go ahead and put them in chat now. Uh, and I will put, uh, have you done any research on replacing QRAMs with neuromorphic chips? Um, I have not done any research on that. Um, I feel like that would be fairly complicated. Like, I mean, QRAMs really kind of highlight, I think, one of the, a, a substantial problem, which is I.O. to a quantum computer. <laughs> you know, it's effectively our way of being able to take classical data and load it in to a program or use use that in a program. Um, so that's kind of like one of the biggest challenges when we're designing quantum algorithms is like, it, especially if we need to use data, <laughs> if they're quantum algorithms that work on, on data, um, we really need to be able to um, be able to actually load that into our quantum program. <laughs> um, so here we go. Um, I will also put a link to the repo here in chat if people want to take a look. Um, but, uh, and, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what neuromorphic chips are. So <laughs> um, it, it sounds interesting. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, so this is our repo. Um, we've been working on this since, uh, for probably about four or five, four months, four months now. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, it, we're still, <laughs> we're still in progress. So we've, we've gotten through kind of most of the implementation parts and we're now kind of trying to improve, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a bit kind of what we have, have left to go. Um, but from a code from like a literal like code or file standpoint, the basic layout is this. Um, we have uh, folders for like all of our library source. We have tests, we have samples, and we have docs. So pretty pretty straightforward from that standpoint. So let's take a look. Uh, the source folder is basically where all the QRAMs get implemented. <laughs> um, you can see a couple different uh, examples here. Uh, we have basically it broken up into there's a file per um, QRAM or QROM type. Um, and then we have one for basically all the common elements, um, any sorts of data types or helper functions that we need um, between all of them. Uh, and uh, you can see in the um, terminal here in the screenshot, I was just building the library. So Q -sharp leverages some of the .NET uh, framework tools for compilation. So, um, basically, you know, for like, what would, it, as a developer, you know, we would change our code and then basically like any other compiled language, you compile it and then you can, you can test it elsewhere. Um, and so at the moment we currently have a uh, bucket brigade uh, uh, implementation for both phase query and bit query implemented as well as simple QROMs and select swap QROMs. Um, I think even Olivia has been working on recently uh, exorcisms. <laughs> there, we're starting to get into the more fun named uh, QRAM proposals. So I, I look forward to what other interesting algorithm names we have here. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, this was and this is kind of just our was our initial packet of work as defined for um, our unitary fund support. So you know our goal is really to implement a lot more different proposals, but uh, we kind of were trying to set up um, a lot of framework along the way. So um, 
as, as kind of like a sample of some of the stuff that is um, that we've used to implement um, some new types for our memories. So um, Q sharp allows you to define Q sharp is a typed language um, and it allows you to define allows you to define new types. Um, and here I just wanted to kind of show like the signatures for our QROM and QRAM um, types, which kind of give you an idea of how you would use them. So like here QROMs, um, once you create them, you'd have basically the ability to read and just check out some metadata on them. So like what, how many address bits do they have and how many data bits do they have? Um, and similarly, you can see for QRAMs, we have a phase query and a bit query um, method that, or um, operation that you can use, a write operation, and then uh, again, some metadata, which is helpful for like when you're trying to say, I give you a QRAM and you don't, you didn't make it. <laughs> and so you don't know how many address bits it's using. So we found it really helpful to kind of keep some of that metadata uh, right there with, with the type itself. Uh, so let's actually just use it here in our browser. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, this is, uh, the service is basically running a, a Jupyter notebook. So Q sharp can be used in a ton of different places in a ton of different ways. So you know, we saw the screenshots before of, you know, effectively writing code and then an IDE and you compile it. And that's kind of like a pretty typical or standard experience, uh, you know, for a compiled language, uh, for, for a compiled language. Um, this, it, what's currently running for the presentation is actually a Q -sharp kernel for Jupyter Notebook. So being a Python developer, I really like doing stuff in Jupyter Notebooks because I can include documentation. I can make nice presentations like this and I can have all the code run directly here as a part of the presentation. So what I've done here is I've just simply said, hey, um, uh, kernel, can you just go make sure uh, to load our QRAM package here? So. I did that with this uh, package uh, magic command here, which uh, you can in the Q sharp kernel. Oops. I'm in presentation mode, so I can't add anymore. <laughs> you can uh, do percent ls magic uh, to find out what other magic commands uh, exist to basically uh, help you learn more about that. Ah, they went to the next page. <laughs> uh, we'll do. Yeah, so you can see here um, a whole different list of kind of different um, magic commands are a uh, are a concept shared by like Python and um, so normally it would just be like uh, there are lots of ones for Python. These are ones specific for Q Sharp. <laughs> so um, things like reloading your workspace or checking what you have uh, compiled. And you can see here even um, how uh, you will be able to submit jobs to Azure Quantum in the future. So you'll be able to do that directly from Jupyter Notebooks, as well as check the status of your jobs. Um, anyway, so, uh, but I'm here. I want to actually try running some of my QROM code here. So here, we're, um, I'm going to be doing some code snippets that implement a QROM. Uh, so here, uh, kind of like you would see in Python or other languages, um, so Python has imports, Q Sharp has open statements. Um, these don't necessarily add any, the, your opening namespaces, that's kind of the most analogous um, concept. Uh, so then we have access, now we would have access to anything uh, or have the short name access <laughs> to anything in these namespaces. I could always put the fully qualified name for everything if I needed to, or if I wanted to, but I like to be able to read my code. <laughs> um, so I'm also going to define a function here. Um, Q sharp, basically you have two things you can define functions and operations. <laughs> uh, functions you can think of as really fairly close to the mathematical concept. They are going to be like deterministic, you know, like sine of X is a function uh, here. This is literally just defining and returning to me a static um, type populated with some data. 
Um, so it's in fact returning to me a memory bank, which is a custom type we've defined in this package. Um, so now that I have some memory or I have some data that we're gonna use to generate this QROM, uh, we can go ahead. Um, I'm gonna find two operations here. So operations are, um, if you wanna actually work with qubits, uh, you need to be doing that in an operation because uh, that basically lets the compiler know uh, like operations imply side effects. And here like qubits aren't objects you really pass around. Uh, our program here creates instructions for um, an act like we write code <laughs> and then uh, decides what instructions to run on the device uh, that you're targeting. Um, so our two operations we're defining here, this is the one that we're basically going to run in a second. So we can give it a query address and it's going to generate that memory data, create a memory, and then uh, query and measure that memory. <laughs> and return us what data was stored at that um, address. And so this operation breaks out into, here's actually our using statement. So here's actually where we're getting, we're asking uh, the system for qubits. And here we're allocating two registers of qubits uh, you, that's indicated by these square brackets. Um, so we're giving some names to them, but so we're calling them address register and target register. Um, but this is saying, all right, we're going to allocate a register of qubits uh, of uh, memory address size. So this is, this is where we're asking for that metadata from our type. <laughs> um, this is why this is a useful thing uh, to have. So you, all you have to do is pass the memory and you can kind of ask for all of these properties um, or unwrap the type to get uh, this information. Uh, so then we uh, can use uh, some really nice built-in operation, a really nice built-in operation called apply poly from bit string. So I can actually just say, here's a register and here's a bit string. <laughs> Please apply this operation, in this case a poly specifically, wherever it is one. So, um, you know, I could write for loops and I could, I could do it any number of different ways, but this is a, I like how readable this is, um, is, it just, it says what it does. <laughs> um, and here's where we're actually going to read from the memory. So here um, we have our memory and the double colons here, um, we're, we're asking for this operation that is part of memory and giving it our address register and a target register. So that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, so what, is, what does this actually um, look like when we run it? Um, so I, I put here the data that's actually hard coded. Um, in this case, uh, you can certainly pass in data as well. But all right, so uh, we've got a magic command here that simulate. Um, so we're going to simulate our QROM query sample operation. And this is the, if it has any arguments, this is where you provide the arguments. And our argument was, uh, what address do we want to look up? Um, and you can see here that it did in fact find <laughs> that five was stored there. Um, the simulate magic command here is using, um, Q Sharp has an idea of target machines. So you can write your program once and you can target any number of different um, target machines, which uh, can include things like a full, full quantum si simulator. Um, it can include hardware uh, when that's available, um, which is part of actually the Azure Quantum service, um, which is in private preview right now. Um, or it could also be the resource estimator, <laughs> which, uh, so if we try to, so if we use this uh, percent estimate, we can pass in an operation, um, literally any operation. And, uh, and if there's any arguments here, again, we're providing a query address um, and we can actually see um, what it would cost <laughs> um, here, not necessarily like money, but like <laughs> um, how many different types of gates. Um, and these are kind of um, set up or counted in ways that are, are generally accepted metrics. So here uh, the depth is the T depth. Um, the width is the number of qubits 
Um, so yeah, we can see this would take seven qubits and this also actually does give us a sum and like a, a max as well. But this was basically kind of the killer app for us is we could, as long as we could implement these QRAMs, we could write programs and as easy as this figure out how many resources it would take. And that also gave us a really good kind of feedback loop for if we, you know, we're trying to do optimizations on the implementations so we can just optimize, estimate, optimize, estimate. Um, certainly like, obviously there are other ways to do estimation, um, namely by hand, <laughs> um, but I, I'm all about uh, trying to find ways to get computers to do, do the math and do the work for us. So <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that's basically the, the primary, you know, source folder or, or the contents of our library. Um, we also have been building and trying to um, make sure that what we are putting there in the library is well tested. Um, that kind of presents a couple um, challenges in the fact that uh, we obviously can't simulate things with more than about 30, 32 qubits locally. And pretty quickly, especially as, as you can imagine with the QRAMs, uh, the number of qubits blows up. So uh, basically how our tests work is we run actual tests on, um, on code against simulators for small instances, you know, small number of data bits, small number of address bits, things like that. Um, and what we can do past that is we can actually count resources <laughs> on, on larger inf instances and make sure that those match with you know, either hand computed numbers or, or if we can cross reference them with a paper, um, we can kind of verify scaling that way. Um, and, you know, hopefully if both of those things pass, then our implementation is correct. <laughs> um, and so especially once you start to get a lot of tests, <laughs> I found that, uh, so I normally use VS Code, which, so this is a screenshot from like my actual daily driver editor. Um, but once you start like looking at all the test results as like huge command line printouts, um, one of my another one of my team members on this, uh, he normally uses v Visual Studio, which was not really an, an IDE that I'd really used much. I generally was like, this is too complicated. I'd rather I'd rather not. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it actually has some really neat tools that all actually straight out of the box work with Q Sharp. So like all of our testing framework works with the test explorers and stuff in Visual Studio. So that actually made it really easy. We at one point, um, as you can imagine, uh, with things that have lots of bit strings and addresses, we had things where like uh, things were getting flipped or whatever. And like we were trying to manually trace to through it and it just got, got really hard <laughs> uh, to just, you know, like be reading printouts all the time. So it was really helpful to have kind of like selectively just be like, I'll run this, this test, I'll make this tweak, all right, Let's run these two tests if it passes and you know just use that as like a feedback loop for our actual development process um, that really is an experience that i haven't had before doing quantum software development um, you know i've i've been <laughs> effectively doing that since grad school like when when i went to school like we none of these projects existed so it was mainly whatever you and your classmates wrote <laughs> and shared to kind of like help double check homework and stuff like that. But this is a, this is a nice first class experience. Um, and another part, uh, so another directory that we have in our project is the docs. That's really important to us because that's how we can communicate to people about what is, what is even going on here. <laughs> um, you know, we can't personally sit and talk to everyone who is interested or whatever. So, you know, it's really important to us that we have good docs and this is kind of, um, I think oh, one of the things that we're kind of working on to kind of close out this current kind of work package for this. But right now, um, so Olivia, who I mentioned, who did the uh, talk on kind of a deep dive on different QRAM uh, proposals, has been writing this kind of primer as we go. So as we learn about an implementation and figure it out, uh, she kind of ends up writing like lecture notes and then we'll kind of end up um, turning these into like an interactive docs uh, website to go with the library. Um, something else that I just 
I like enough that I wanted to mention is uh, so with with tools that uh, support uh, IntelliSense, so Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code support this, um, and a few others maybe. Um, Q Sharp has IntelliSense built in, and not only does it give you like the help and autocompletes for library and built-in functions, it it can look at your API docs and do that for functions and operations that you write as well. So that was really helpful because I can't count how many times I have swapped some of like, do we do this like big Indian or little Indian or our, um, yeah, just, you know, small things that normally, you know, especially when you're working on a team, it's like, oh, I refactored this and, you know, rearranged everything. Uh, when you have kind of like the IntelliSense pop up to just, and as long as you keep the, the API docs updated, uh, that has been a big help. <laughs> um, so yeah, what, what do we have uh, kind of left and upcoming for this library? Um, we've got, uh, we wanna do more detailed resource counting um, for subroutines. So kind of as we talked about at the beginning, um, you know, it's, it's a one, setting up a QRAM is one thing, <laughs> um, but really the most expensive part is querying it because that's what you're going to end up doing. You're not going to make a bunch of memories. You're going to query a memory a whole bunch of times. And how many times depends on the design of the algorithm that needs it. Um, so, but that's kind of really should be our focus of where we want to optimize those resource counts. Um, so uh, right now we can get the resource counts for basically full programs. Um, we can do that where we have like a query in the program and not and then kind of infer what the query costs were. Um, but uh, Q Sharp actually has a really detailed trace simulator where you can kind of go through and um, manually make, make, uh, make your own kind of like resource counter. So the, the estimator, resource estimator, as we saw here in the notebook, um, is kind of like a, a special case of the trace simulator. So definitely very easy to use, but also, you know, here where we want to actually get like how many resources for just this part of the, our program. Um, so we have a path forward on that. Um, we want to, like I said, we want to get some more documentation in an act, interactive like docs browser. Um, we want to actually, once, we, <laughs> once we've run everything and got the final numbers, uh, we want to actually put this into a research paper and, and share that with the community. Um, and hopefully uh, add more more proposals as we move forward. Um, you know, it would be, I would love it so much if people like filed issues of new proposals that they were interested in, in seeing us implement or, or perhaps even try to help us implement them themselves. So, you know, that kind of, uh, we are, we're very public about our process. So um, all of our milestones for this project uh, are, <laughs> sorry. Are you good, Chewy? My puppy has to hang out here while I while I talk. Um, so we're very public about our process. Um, so you can always see like what milestones we're working on. Um, you know, see how what issues we have or what tasks we have kind of pending for things. Um, I think this has been a really great way to help us engage actually with our community, which kind of brings me to my last point here, uh, which is. <laughs> lessons learned, like lessons learned and kind of best practice discussion uh, for open source quantum development. So just to make sure, uh, you know, kind of we're all on the same page, open source software here uh, means just software that can be freely accessed, used, changed, and shared. There's a ton of different licenses that, you know, are considered open source. Um, everything we're doing is um, MIT licensed. Uh, which is a fairly common, um, like, fairly low restriction um, license, but, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways you can license and, and use open source. Um, open source communities are basically everything but the literal code of a project. So, um, it includes things like the licenses, the processes and governance, funding, blogging and social media, diversity, uh, mentorship, um, like codes of conduct, like there are so many different aspects to a community that are more than just kind of the output of the community, if that makes sense. 
Um, and we've seen so many times in the classical computer, um, like cas classical computing um, ecosystem, how well these open source projects uh, and communities can, like the things they make are just incredible. Like, I mean, Python is an entire open source community. So is um, uh, the Mozilla Foundation, uh, like so many, <laughs> so many of the tools like I'm even currently using right now, like, um, are, are all open source projects. And so um, I really think that we need to, as the quantum computing community kind of moves into like, you know, we have um, open source software tooling, but we don't have as many of these like communities necessarily that are kind of established and, you know, have, um, have a lot of engagement. So uh, there certainly are things that exist. So uh, a couple of them that I want to highlight are the Quantum Open Source Foundation, uh, QSOF. They, they have a really great website with some really great resources um, on uh, just different projects, like literally just what's out there. <laughs> they, they have a really good survey of all that. Um, so the community uh, that I'll be kind of talking about in depth here is the QSharp community, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, I also, uh, I run a group called Wicca as well, which is, um, you know, not platform specific, but it's folks who are interested in quantum computing and applications. I mean, this is a meetup group and also a community. Like there are so many, uh, so many different, um, like we're starting a lot of these communities. And I guess, you know, what I want to talk about here is just making sure we're conscious and intentional of the decisions we're making as we're building them. Um, to make sure that we actually make them the best communities that they can be. Um, and as noted here, I think it's also important to keep in mind, you know, how, how does our history here <laughs> influence how we build our communities in the future? And, you know, how does the fact that most people, you know, initially were coming from actual research and academia areas, you know, now we have industry players, how does that impact who's actually a part of our community who's and who's actually welcomed as a part of the community. So um, one, if, if there's one thing I can communicate about with this part of the talk is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is so many good practices and, and helpful resources out there that you can use. I've, I've linked two, three here. <laughs> that is such a small subset of, but uh, these I think are kind of good overarching like umbrella resources, if you will. They link to a whole bunch more as well. Um, but uh, these include things like, uh, so I do wanna look at this one in particular. So this is, I've, I've looked at this one a lot. This is actually um, created and maintained by uh, GitHub and a number of other open source uh, foundations and actually has some really, really good tips and kind of like case studies um, to really help understand how to build these communities. So like things like being responsive, um, making sure you have a place for your community, don't tolerate bad actors. So um, can I, okay. So tons of really good resources. Please don't try to reinvent the wheel. Find, you know, find the resources that other people have kind of spent the time doing the research on and leverage those in your communities. Um, so as, as a founder and maintainer for QSharp community, uh, our mission is we want to empower everyone to get involved in quantum development. Um, things that we prioritize and make, make sure that, you know, anytime we have an event or create a space um, that we prioritize are making sure that everyone feels safe and welcome. Codes of conduct are absolutely critical. I, implore you if you are running meetups or, or groups or anything, please have a code of conduct. Just Google code of conduct template and you can find tons of really good ones out there. But really what that does as a, as a maintainer or as a host, um, it gives you the tools like that you need to say, you know, if there is bad behavior or, you know, somebody is, you know, harassing or even just doing things that you don't want, <laughs> uh, it gives you an easy path. You can say, hey, look, you looked at the code of conduct before you joined this event. Sorry, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. And you don't have to like explain why the behavior is bad. That was just already you know laid out as a part of the code of conduct. Um, and 
you know, I, I've personally had <clears throat> had to leverage these a lot um, in in my like, as we'll see um, in some of the communities, not necessarily Q Sharp community, but in like the academic communities I've been in. Um, and we want to make sure like we want to support each other no matter how you work. Uh, so there's no like tool bashing. I don't care whether you use Q like. I mean, nominally, we're here to help each other with Q Sharp stuff, but you know, I don't care, you know, and I don't want people getting um, yelled at or made fun of for using Vim or even, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Like, we're all here to actually contribute and build things together. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand how our community communicates. So we've gone through a couple different iterations of different com like chat platforms and stuff like that. Um, we currently have a Slack that seems to be the, the most um, consistent with the people that we're trying to reach out to. Um, and, you know, we try to make sure that we're responsive there, we're posting good content um, that keeps people engaged. Um, and we want to make sure that we support members of all skill levels. So, you know, um, I know a lot of groups, you know, try to target, you know, little to no quantum experience, which is really awesome because those are some of the huge you know, some of the customer segment and some of the user segment here that we really need to target, um, but sometimes then miss the mark on like mismatch in the skill level of the resources that we provide. Um, you know, I, I think of a lot like undergrad seminar talks where, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, professor is invited to come give talk. They give a talk that was appropriate for their grad students, but leaves undergrads, uh, you know, when they're told that this is like a one-on-one -on -one level talk that, you know, oh shit, maybe I don't actually understand this and maybe I can't do this. So um, we try to make sure that, you know, we are connecting people with the right, um, right resources to help them succeed. And honestly, I've been really excited to see how much mentorship, um, both informal and formal uh, we've been seeing. So uh, QSOF, the Quantum Open Source Foundation has a new round of mentorship starting um, I think next month. So definitely check out their website to apply either to be a mentor or a mentee. Um, it it seems like a really, really neat program for like a formal mentorship uh, setup. So QRAM here is a, an official Q Sharp community project. <laughs> it basically started because a number of us in the community were talking with some researchers and uh, namely Olivia. And that's kind of where we, we ended up um, we're like, hey, this this seems like this would be an appropriate, good project to, to build here. So, how do we actually? One of the things I, I commented in the in my outline is, um, you know, especially with with COVID and, and changes to um, everything being remote, you know, how some of us were local that we could have like maybe talked uh, in person, but just more generally, like our communities are going to be pretty distributed. Um, pandemic or not. So how do we actually develop workflows that we can actually work together um, productively and don't involve like, you know, constant um, confusion or just like, you know, what's going on. Again, I'll appeal to the other people who have solved this problem before, you know, we've just tried to do our best to like read and listen and understand what has worked for other people and figure out from that what has worked for us. So um, we basically have a standing, we have standups every day if needed. Um, we have a Slack channel for kind of more semi-permanent discussions. Um, we definitely try to do as much as we can also in the issues on our repo so that other people who are just coming, coming up to the project can kind of see our thought process as we go. Um, we are all using different operating systems and tool sets. So um, that's one of the, you know, one of the nice things for choosing the platform and tools that we have. Um, and so the the two things that I think are most unique about how we've been working uh, are, um, I've been basically doing live programming on Twitch uh, to develop this library. And then my collaborators would join in chat <laughs> and uh, we would code together there as well as with anyone else who kind of happened to drop by. And I would do Visual Studio um, live shares. So basically what that meant was, you know, I would open up my editor and you could basically Google Docs or, you know, any sort of like 
shared document, imagine your code, but as a shared document um, with anyone who I was working with. So, you know, this is kind of like a GIF of seeing people in different editors. You can just see where other people are and you can say, oh, hey, what about this part here? It is literally one of my favorite tools like ever. I've been using it for a couple of years now and it has truly changed how I, how I program. <laughs> um, and so like here you can see a screenshot of like, if you're not familiar, Twitch is like a streaming, um, a live streaming platform, you know, kind of like YouTube, but just not permanent. It only stores the videos for a couple weeks. Um, and is generally been intended for gamers. So like you live stream, you're playing games, but there's actually been a huge kind of um, growing community of folks who actually do development. And so um, I'm part of a live coders team uh, on Twitch where basically we're all just a bunch of people who have different languages and platforms that we work in. And you can, you know, sometimes people are learning a new language as well, and you can kind of learn it with them while they're coding. And then, you know, kind of like in this platform here, we have we have the chat, and um, you know, I, I really enjoy like while I'm working, <laughs> having people be like, "Oh, you forgot the semicolon," and then I'm like, "Ah, I guess yes, I did. <laughs> that's why that's not working." <laughs> um, so it's. I have really, really enjoyed this as like, you know, it sounded terrifying at the beginning, but it actually turns, I think has turned out to be like one of my favorite parts of working on this project. Um, so some other things that we've actually made kind of as consequences of what we needed for this project is a bunch of actual project templates for the next time we want to do these things. So uh, like, if you wanna make a new Q -sharp library, we actually have a template that you can start from that has uh, basic build automation, all kind of like the boilerplate stuff that you need, contribution guides, codes of conduct. So you can just like one click, start your new project and you can have basically the benefits of all the, the best practice already set up for you. Um, and things like uh, containers and portable development. So the fact that we can run the QROM code, like. Technically, there's a Docker image on the back end here, but like literally in your browser, someone could walk up and help us develop QRAM, which I think is really, really powerful and also really helps solve the well, it worked on my machine problem. <laughs> but I'm sure if you've ever written code with multiple people that you've probably run into that issue. So in kind of conclusion here, things that I have personally learned from this project uh, is uh, finding people with different skills sets to work with. Uh, is really, really fun. So like, you know, I've, my background is I, I did my PhD in, in quantum computing from um, Institute of Quantum Computing. Like I worked as a postdoc for a while. Um, I've worked in industry as a product developer or as a research engineer, like doing commercial product development. Um, and, you know, especially on, this was, I think the first software project where I'd worked with people with really, really different skill sets. Um, and, it is so cool, like what we can do, because, you know, I, I'm uh, kind of the Q sharp expert. Uh, Olivia is the, um, she's the researcher who specializes in QRAM. We have Rolf, who's an expert. Uh, he's actually uh, in like DevOps and also many different other things as well. He has a lot of experience uh, in kind of tech. And so like, it's really awesome to like, be able to sit down, like when we have a problem, just kind of pull, <laughs> pull the team and just be like, wow, we can actually do this. You know, I, I kind of coming from it, like my academic mentality is like, well, I guess I will have to figure this out myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> especially with Twitch, uh, when I started, I had pretty much no viewers. Uh, now I have uh, anywhere from like 20 to 100 people whenever I'm streaming. Uh, talking to an empty room is really hard. <laughs> and so I really appreciate it when people, you know, actually just drop in the chat, say, hey, how's it going? <laughs> um, but like talking to yourself about writing code for hours is is kind of difficult. <laughs> um, but kind of like I said before, it's, it's hard to do things outside of your comfort zone. But weirdly, I think in this case, you know, this was my motivation or accountability was like people were count, you know, were planning on me being there and working on this in public. And so, you know, I think it gave me a really good, um, accountability and encouragement to actually, you know, not only, I, I was learning the stuff about QRAM because that was not necessarily a, a quantum topic I had experience in, 
So like I was learning QRAM stuff, uh, other team members were learning Q sharp, you know, we were all learning C sharp and you know, it's, it was just really fun to kind of do that with a group. And yeah, always be learning. <laughs> there is like, there's always a new tool or new framework. Don't, don't be afraid to like try and figure out something new, especially when you have people around you, around you who can help. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the, the entirety of what I had to say here. <laughs> um, in review, <laughs> QRAM is hard, uh, possibly not even achievable, depending. Um, and there's kind of two, two main approaches uh, are called QRAM and QROM. We implemented a library that implements a number of these different proposals uh, that you know, we've been doing resource estimation on and we're trying to basically profile and characterize which types of memory will be useful in which use cases. Um, and communities really help us build the quantum solutions that we want to. So um, thinking about the non-code parts of projects, you know, while sometimes it's not really fun, <laughs> actually makes the doing the code part of the project a lot more fun and, and easier to build new things. Um, and making sure that we have open inclusive spaces means everyone can actually participate and be a part of building these solutions. Um, so my call to action for you would be uh, go go try it out. <laughs> I would love to have some testers or have people, even if you're just doing like the stuff on the browser, um, file some bugs and feedback for us. Uh, you know, if, if you're uh, motivated, like write some blog posts about it, tear it to shreds. I don't care. <laughs> I want to know what you think about it. Um, and go use some of the tools that we built to build new stuff for your work and research. Um, <laughs> And do what you can to make the communities, you know, we're all, we're here from industry, we're here from academia, we're here from um, a variety of different kind of communities and, you know, be a good steward and try to um, make your communities better by kind of leveraging some of these best practice, uh, best practice things. Um, please make sure there are codes of conduct for things, join mentoring programs and uh, try out some new tools for remote remote work. Like I'm sure we've all been <laughs> trying desperately to find find new ways to keep keep ourselves productive um, when we can't necessarily go into the office. But uh, there are some really neat tools out there to, to kind of um, improve that experience. So thanks. And here are some links.